Good morning and welcome to New Hope. We're so glad you're here today. If you're a visitor, we'd like to hear from you. Please use the Connect card in the pew in front of you and give us your information. We promise not to come knock on your door, but we would like to send you some information about us in the mail. We're honored that you joined us today. And if you're not a visitor, but you're a member, we'd also like to hear from you. If you have prayer requests or an address change, use the same Connect card. Thank you, and we're glad you came. Good morning, New Hope Community Church. On Tuesday, December 11th, the Seniors Ministry will gather for a Christmas luncheon. We ask that you would bring a potluck dish that celebrates your family's heritage and be prepared to share the recipe, which we will then compile into a cookbook for distribution in January. We look forward to celebrating with you. Good morning, church. I would really enjoy getting together with you on a personal basis. Whether for medical issues you might have, we could pray about, or personal concerns, or any other reason. I would love to have the opportunity to meet with you anytime. You may even know someone that you would like for me to visit. I'd be glad to do that. My email and phone number are on the church website. Or you can call Angel in the office and she will give you my information. Thank you for this opportunity and I'm looking forward to visiting with you very soon. God bless. Good morning, ladies. We have some exciting things coming up for you in 2019. We're developing several clubs for you and the first one up is a book club. There's more information on that later and we'll have a meeting, but what I'd like from you today is if you're interested in being one of the hostesses to one of the book clubs, because we'll probably have several of them, please email me on our church website and I'll be in touch with you. Thank you for considering this wonderful ministry. We're gonna have a great time. Let's all get involved. On January the 6th is our first Sunday of the month evening service. It's at 5 p.m. in the sanctuary. It's a family style service and we have communion. For the start of the new year, we'll be starting with the Daniel plan. This is a Bible study that we'll be studying on Wednesday nights, but the kickoff is on the Sunday night service. So if you're interested in learning more about what the Daniel plan is about, it's about faith, food, fitness, friends, and focus, then it's a great time to start off the new year with this Bible study. See you at 5 p.m. January the 6th. We just want to let you know about all the Christmas services that are coming up this month. On the 16th of December at 5 p.m., we have a special production of the Kids Play. That'll be the Christmas Express. So that's in the Sanctuary at 5 p.m. on the 16th. For our Christmas services on December 23rd, we're starting in the Sanctuary at 7.45, and then there's the 9.15 and the 11 o'clock service. The Christmas choir will be singing in that service, so come along and get in the Christmas spirit. This Christmas Eve, we have two services. The first one is at 4 p.m., the second one is at 9 p.m., and it's come as you are, dressed however you like, whether you're dressed to the nines or you're still wearing your pajamas. Come along and join us for Christmas Eve at New Hope. Uh, there's some clipboards that are going to go around today that is uh, for the senior luncheon. So if you haven't signed up already and you'd like to go to the senior lunch um, and it's a potluck style heritage type recipes so we can put together a book of all the recipes from your families um, and to distribute next year. Um, so it should be a lot of fun. Uh, come along and bring potluck for that. Sign up if you haven't already done that. If you have, please don't sign up again. Uh, that gives us some idea of numbers. Uh, other announcements that we have, the Angel Tree gifts are due today. So if you haven't brought an Angel Tree gift back yet, please um, run out after the service, go buy one and bring it out. Or you can call Janice Little, her number is in the bulletin, then you can call and make arrangements to drop it off with Prism Fellowship uh, at your convenience. Also, the, uh, we've done the save the date for that. Uh, the Widow's Lunch Bunch is meeting next Sunday um, at 12.30, and then they're going to the... Um, the Christmas show after that at Clovis North. Uh, the children's play. If you haven't been to a children's play here at New Hope, come to this one because this is going to be very funny. It's going to have a great Christmas message. Kids have been working really hard on it, so it'll be great to see you guys out supporting the children's ministry for their play. Jen and Corey have been working hard with these kids, and trust me, it's not an easy thing to do, get 25 kids to participate 
uh, in a play all at the right time and with the limited amount of time that they have to rehearse and all that kind of stuff. So it um, should be a lot of fun to come along and there'll be hot chocolate, cookies, that kind of stuff. Um, the New Odin sponsorship, this is, it was due the end of November. If you haven't paid for the sponsorship for the New Odin kids in the Ivory Coast yet, then there is, uh, if you could contact Shelley, go into the office, do whatever, get that taken care of as soon as you can. We would appreciate it. Uh, there are no donuts today, as you could see. We didn't, we're taking a break this week because Tim's not there, and I think the logistics of donuts is quite tough. So next weekend, there will be donuts for sale, $5 for a dozen, the mini donuts that we had last week, so be prepared for that next week, and all the proceeds go to the barn fund for the new building. <clears throat> um, something I wanted to talk about today is, I preached about hospitality in the summer, um, and I talked about Safe Families for Children, a ministry that we're partnering with uh, so that we can provide families in the church that will have a kind of preemptive foster care situation. So. This organization pulls together churches and families in churches that were, are willing to take children into their home when the parents of the children or a parent has uh, some kind of crisis in their life or whether things are just going downhill rapidly and they feel like it would be better for their kids not to be around them because they don't want to take them down with them, basically, or have CPS come in and take them away. So it's kind of preemptive. So they contact this organization, the churches get involved, Kids go to host families, and that kind of gets them in a safe situation while the parent or parents are sorting themselves out and getting themselves back in a situation where they can be with their children. So this is not, you know, to take them away forever. This is really, and you work with the parents to, through, a, through another sort of liaison in order to make sure that things are good and things are going well. They get to see their kids. It's not like foster care system a lot of the times. Um, so this is a great organization, and it really, you know, people contact me, or the church, at Christmas time, and they say, what can we do to help a family? We really want to help a family this Christmas. And that's great, and I, you know, helping families at Christmas time is great, but this is much more of a long-term plan. So we're looking for host families to get the ball rolling. We have a lot of interest. We have people that are interested that maybe are not quite ready yet, and that's fine, but um, if you are interested as a host family, uh, we want that first family just to get going so that we can... Because things tend to follow once you get a, a family like signed up initially. Uh, so we'd love to get that first family going. Uh, it takes a little time, some background checks, stuff like that, to become a host family. You don't have to take all the referrals. Uh, referrals come along all the time, and you don't have to take them if it doesn't suit the sort of thing or the situation or the time period that works for you. So just getting signed up doesn't commit you to anything immediately. It just means you're ready to go if a referral comes along. The type of referrals that I've been seeing recently have been anything from newborn um, up to, you know, newborn baby. Um, there's family, there's just no one around that can help. Um, the mother was trying to get some things sorted out and so just needed someone for two weeks. That's it, two weeks to look after the baby while they get back on their feet. Um, the other one, the other extreme is 17-year-old boy. It's just, and this worked out really, really well. Um, so. You know, you just never quite know what you're going to get. It's not usually for very long, a couple of days, a couple of weeks, maybe a couple of months at most. I haven't seen any more than two months at this time. Uh, there's always time you can do If it is a long-term one, you could do a month, and then somebody else can do a month and beyond that. So it doesn't have to be a major commitment. It's not, it's not a militant organization in the sense that they force you into certain situations. Whatever you can do helps immensely, and it helps families. Um, stay together rather than ending up being split up and in foster care system and then long term not good things happen sometimes with that. So if you're interested in Safe Families for Children, contact me and I can show you where to sign up uh, and we can get the ball rolling, it takes a little time, uh, but you'll be ready for the new year, ready to go uh, to be able to help families in those situations. Um, prayer requests this morning. Uh, prayers continue, prayers please for... <clears throat> Dan Sullivan, Irma McGuinn, and uh, Jenny Stages as they fight through cancer. These are three people that are really putting on a brave fight. They're really fighting hard, and prayer works immensely. It helps them, and uh, prayer is a very, very important part of what we can do as a church to support the people, the, the rest of our church family here. So please pray for them, and pray for the strength for them. Pray for medical personnel that are working with them to make all the right decisions and to get through this very, very difficult part of their lives. Uh, Barbara English had surgery recently and Katie Froman, so please 
Pray for them as they continue recovery from their surgeries. Uh, Marlene Paulus, please pray for her. Monday she has surgery, tomorrow morning she has surgery, so <clears throat> we will be visiting with her in the morning. Um, so keep her in your praise. And Ziva Hammock, um, just you know, ongoing health issues, major health issues under hospice, so keep her in your prayers as you go through this week. Um, if you have prayer requests, as we said on the video, please, we would like to pray for you. Um, please put them on a card, put them in the offering. Uh, so that we are aware of it. Every Tuesday we meet and we pray as a staff and we write down all the prayers and we pray throughout the week. <clears throat> because like I say, prayer is hugely essential in the church. Okay, I'd like to ask our ushers to come forward for the offerings this morning. And let's pray. <clears throat> Lord God, this season is one that uh, should be full of pure joy. And Lord, we just ask that we embrace that this Christmas time. And that we can take away everything else that's distracting and just focus on what's important. And that's your son, Jesus Christ. The gift that you gave us that changed the world. It's never been the same since. We're just thankful for that. And Lord, we just pray that we can see your hand in everything that we do, everything around us, so that we can find joy. We lift up to you the people that we've mentioned this morning for prayer. and We just pray that they will be safe, that they will be strong in what they're doing, fighting cancer or recovering from surgeries. We just pray for strength for them and we just pray for the medical people that work on them, that they will be, <clears throat> that they will be wise in all the decisions that they make. And we're just thankful that there are so many good medical facilities around us that can provide so much good health care when so many have so little. Lord, we just thank you for all the generosity of the people here in this church, and that, whether it's for Angel Tree or any other um, pushes that we've done this, this year. We're thankful that we've had such a successful year when it comes to giving. And Lord, we just pray for this coming year, for all the ministries that are around the church. So we just pray that this, year, this coming year will be full of, um, full of your Holy Spirit, and that people will fill your spirit when they study the Bible, when they come to events, when they come to church, that, Lord, there is nothing better than knowing that your spirit flows through us as we go through our lives, and it strengthens us and provides us with the wisdom that we need to make the right decisions. Lord, we, we pray for all this and more. In Jesus' name, amen. So that's a clip from the movie Inside Out. And I heard down here, she says, I love joy. That's good. That's a good attitude to have today. Um, Inside Out's a great movie. It's one of those Pixar movies that's really good for kids or adults. So if you haven't watched it and you're an adult, then just I recommend it. It's a lot of fun. Um, <clears throat> there's a great scene in it where there's the parents sitting at the table with Riley and when she's older, and, um, and it just goes into all their heads and the emotions that are going on as they're having a discussion. It's a very, very funny scene because they have like joy and fear, uh, anger, disgust, and sadness. And so they're all interacting together. Anyway, enough advertising for Disney. So, um, well, you've seen the t-shirts. Choose joy. Well, this is the sermon. So I was inspired. Do we have music on? Today? Yeah. I hear music in the background. It's good. So today we're going to talk about choosing joy, sort of continuing on a Christmas theme. Pastor Tim was doing the unopened gift, and I'm going to try and loosely connect it with that because he said, well, you can do whatever you want, and I thought, well, I'll try and connect it in some way. But, um, and it does connect a little bit because the unopened gift, it's kind of a choice that we make every single hour of every single day, whether we embrace joy, the joy of having Christ in our lives, or whether we succumb to the pressures of everyday life and we ignore this incredible gift that God has given us. Uh, the scripture that we're going to look at today is kind of long, and I know, and it's in 1 Kings. So I know some people are thinking, oh, he's going to read a whole lot from 1 Kings. It's Old Testament. Trust me, this is a really good piece of scripture, and the story is awesome. And I really want to focus on the last part, but I can't really get to the last part without giving you the rest of it because it's really important leading up to the last part. So. We're going to read quite a bit, and I don't know if we have it on the... Oh, we don't have the screen down, but anyway. Um, so it's in 1 Kings chapter 18. We're going to start at verse 16 and go all the way through to about 40-something. So, um, 
It's the story of Elijah and his challenges to the prophet of Baal. So Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him, and Ahab went to meet with Elijah. And when he saw Elijah, he said to him, Is that you, the troubler of Israel? I have not made trouble for Israel, Elijah replied, but you and your father's family have. You have abandoned the Lord's commands and have followed the Baals. Now summon the people from all over Israel and meet me on Mount Carmel and bring the 450, the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. That's 850 prophets. Just keep that in mind. So Ahab sent the word through all Israel and assembled the prophets on Mount Carmel. Elijah went before the people and said, How long will you waver between two opinions? Is the Lord God? If the Lord is God, follow him. If Baal is God, then follow him. But the people said nothing. Then Elijah said to them, I am the only one of the Lord's prophets left, but Baal has 450 prophets. Get two bulls for us. Let Baal's prophets choose one for themselves and let them cut it into pieces and put it on wood and not set fire to it. I will then you call on the name of your God and I'll call on the name of, my, of the Lord and the God who answers by fire, he is the God. He is God. And the people said, what you say is good. Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, choose one of the bulls, prepare it first since there are so many of you. Call on the name of God but do not light the fire. So they took the bull given to them and prepared it. Then they called on the name of Baal from morning till noon. Baal, answer us, they shouted. And when there was no response, no one answered. They danced around the altar that they had made. And at noon, Elijah began to taunt them. Shout louder, he said. Surely he is God. A God. Perhaps he is deep in thought or busy or traveling. Maybe he's sleeping and should be awakened. So they shouted louder and slashed themselves with swords and spears as was their custom until their blood flowed. Midday passed, and they continued their frantic prophesying until time for the evening sacrifice. But when there was no response, no one answered, and no one paid attention. Then Elijah said to all of the people, come here to me. They came to him, and he repaired the altar of the Lord, which had been torn down. Elijah took 12 stones, one for each of the 12 tribes, descended from Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, you, you, Your name shall be Israel. With the stones he built an altar on the name of the Lord, and he dug a trench around it large enough to hold two seers of seed. That's about 24 pounds of seed. He arranged the wood, cut the bull into pieces, and laid it on the wood. Then he later said to them, Fill four large jars with water and pour it on the offering and on the wood. Do it again, he said, and they did it again. Do it a third time, he ordered, and they did it a third time. And the water ran down the altar and even filled the trench. At the time of sacrifice, the prophet Elijah stepped forward and prayed, Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and have done all the things that you command. Answer me, Lord, answer me so that these people will know that you, Lord, are God and that you are turning their hearts back again. Then the fire of the Lord kept, fell and burned up the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, and the soil, and licked up the water in the trench. When all the people saw this, they fell down prostrate and cried, The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. Then we skip to verse 44 towards the end. It says, So Elijah said, Go and tell Ahab, Hitch up your chariot and go down before the rain start, stops you. Meanwhile, the sky blew black with clouds and the wind rose. A heavy rain started falling and Ahab rose off to, rode off to Jezreel. The power of the Lord came on Elijah, and tucking his cloak into his belt, he ran ahead of Ahab all the way back to Jezreel. So it's a long story, but it's really to illustrate that this is Elijah alongside God fighting a major battle. And God, as always, comes through in spectacular style. God has shown undeniable strength to Ahab, as well as a total of 850 prophets who had all been praying to their gods. So this was a major victory. And the final part where we see that Elijah is on a major high here. He's almost having fun with this. He challenges them to a duel first in verse 19. He basically says, you guys have 850 prophets, and I'm the only one for the Lord. So let's see what happens. He basically had enough. Verse 21, he says, How long will you be indecisive about this? 
But he got no response from the people. So he was like, fine. I am alone. There's 850 of them. Watch this. So he's a little frustrated. He has to make a point. But soon he has even more fun with it. Verse 27, he starts saying things like, shout louder. He starts taunting all the prophets. 850 of them all shouting, slashing themselves, doing what they need to do. And he's like, shout louder. Maybe your God will hear you. Perhaps he's busy or he's traveling. Not so much the omnipresent God there. Or maybe he's asleep and he needs waking up. If you just shout louder, you might be able to wake him up. But the thing is, he's obviously not worried. He's just having fun saying, say it a little louder. He might wake up and help you. Verses 33 and 34, it gets even more like that. It says, pour water and on the offering and on the wood. So now he's kind of going to make fun of them. He's like, we've got the offering, we've got the wood. Let's pour water on it. Let's make it harder. You don't need water on yours. Trust me, you don't need anything. You just got to hope that lightning strikes. But I'm going to pour water on mine. And then he says, pour it on again. Second time, pour even more water on it. But then he says it a third time. Like He's just like, okay, that's not even enough. Keep going. Pour more water on it. It's like those escape artists. You know, They put on handcuffs. And you think, oh, well, those are hard to get out of. Then they put on ankle cuffs. You're like, well, he's going to have trouble with that. And then they put him in a sack. And they put a, put a lock at the top of the sack. And you're like, I don't even know how he's going to get to that lock on the outside. And you think, whoa, it's going to be hard. But then again, they throw him in a pool. Now he has a time limit because he's going to drown if he doesn't get out of this bag. That puts a lot of tension here. Elijah's kind of doing that. He's saying, put water on it. In fact, I'm not even going to light it, so that's hard enough. Put water on it, that's more difficult. Put even more water on it until it's completely dripping. The whole ground is wet, everything's soaked. And let's see what happens. There's a quick sideline in this, and this is another part of this story that's particularly good. It's like the immense confidence that Elijah has in God. I mean, he's just kind of having fun with it, so he's like, let's just keep going. I mean, he could put a concrete mound over the top of this altar and still not be worried about it, still have the confidence that God is going to do what he needs him to do and that God has told him he will do. So yeah, when it happens, the fire comes down in verse 38. It burns up the sacrifice. It burns up the wet wood. And it, even the soil gets burnt up. It evaporates all the water. There's nothing left. Everything is burnt to a complete crisp. He's stoked. He's like, yes! 850 prophets, take that. He's experiencing the pure joy of God at this point. This is God's victory, not his, but he's kind of like the magician's assistant. It's like, yeah, see what he could do. So, this is God's victory, but he is excited. He's on a high. And I love what happens next. And this is a verse that gets overlooked an awful lot, and it's a shame because it's really good. Firstly, Ahab sets off in a chariot. And this is not a wagon, this is a chariot. And chariots back then were two-wheeled vehicles that were in, had horses in front, like stallions, strong horses, because they were designed for warriors, they were designed for like, games and, and competitions. The wagons were kind of four wheels with a donkey in the front. That was kind of the SUV. Then the Corvette <laughs> was kind of the, the, the chariot. So Ahab, being who he, who he was, he gets a chariot. So he takes off... And then it says here, the, the last bit, which is really good. It says, Elijah tucked his cloak into his belt and takes off running. Now, this is, we've already established Ahab's in the Corvette of the time. He's already taken off. But it says that he ran ahead of Ahab to Jezreel on foot. Ahab took off fast, and no doubt, he's got to get back to Jezebel because he's got to report what happened. They put to death all the 850 prophets, so... There's big trouble coming. Jezebel needs to know. Ahab's heading back there in a hurry. But Elijah, fueled by God, on a high, filled with the joy of the day, passes Ahab on foot. Now, if there's ever a commercial for Nike that you want to see, <laughs> this is going to be it. Because you can imagine Elijah lifting up his cloak, tucking it into his belt, the flash of blue Nikes. And then he takes off running, and there's dust behind him, because it, it's a dusty place, so there must have been dust behind him. He's taken off very quick. This is not just a, you know, this is written in the Bible. He is running ahead of a chariot. So he's taken off, 
And he's running like crazy with the power of God with him. And he passes Ahab. I don't know if they went the same way, but he passes Ahab, and Ahab's probably had enough of his shenanigans for one day because he's already been beaten pretty badly. I don't know if he smiled and waved as he went by. Sort of. <laughs> but I'm sure Ahab at this point has had quite enough of Elijah. But So he's, he's experiencing extreme joy at this point. He's happy. He's, he's running like crazy. But four verses later, and this is the important part about this story, just four verses later, Elijah finds himself under the broom bush, or a juniper tree, some of the other translations say. A juniper tree, and he is begging God to take his life. After being on such a high peak of joy, suddenly he's asking God to take his life. So what is it that has sapped the joy out of Elijah? Well, it was Jezebel. Jezebel said she was going to kill him, anyone associated with him, and Anybody out there that was uh, for her was going to also be looking for him to kill him. And he takes this pretty seriously. Jezebel does not kid around. So he fled to Beersheba and ended up under a juniper tree. That's a pretty drastic change in four verses of the Bible. And that's kind of one of the things I want to talk about this morning is that our perspective in life can really change very quickly and very dramatically. From the mountain peaks and the highs that we experience to the deep valleys and the lows. From running like the wind in victory to sitting under a tree contemplating the end of our life. So we have a choice. We have to choose between how we respond to the things in life. Do we choose joy or do we choose despair and frustration? And the reason I want to talk about it this time of year is because it's particularly magnified at this time of year. Christmas is the most wonderful season. We sing Christmas carols. We plan the gifts that we want to give. We put together wish lists of the stuff that we want to receive. We send cards. We post Christmassy stuff on social media like pictures and sayings. We experience the joy of the Christmas season. But there are so many other things out there that can steal our joy at this time of year. Because at Christmas, we need to get out shopping. We have infinite things that really bring us down, like abrasive and bossy people at this time of year. Gas prices are too high, and we've got to drive more places than we've ever had to drive before because we've got to go to stores, we've got to go to post office, we've got to go to Christmas parties, whatever it is that we need to go to. There's slow traffic lights and slow, inconsiderate drivers. There's slow checkout lines at Walmart, at Target, at Costco, or Save Mart, or whatever. The slow service at restaurants, because there's all these Christmas parties that are in there, and they're just taking all the time of the service, so it's impossible to get two people served in between the time. There's car trouble. There's worry over work, because suddenly the end of the year is coming up. Beyond Christmas, suddenly it's the end of the year, and if you're a salesperson, you've got your quota to meet for the year, and there's a lot of pressure for you to get that done, but no one's buying because it's Christmas, and we'll just put it off till next year. And all that work that you need to get done is putting pressure on family. Because the family wants you to be around for Christmas time. They want you to be around for the holiday preparations. So tension is mounting in the families. Bills are mounting in the mail. Because you need to pay for Christmas. Because obviously the Lord doesn't want us to be frugal this year because it's Christmas. So all of these things around this time period can weigh on us. And it starts after Thanksgiving. We hop into the car, we turn on the radio, and immediately we hear Mariah Carey singing, All I Want for Christmas is You. And while everyone loves a good Christmas song, once you've heard them all 30 to 40 to 50 times, it begins to weigh on you a little bit. <laughs> and shopping. To some, shopping comes very easily. To others, it's the most frustrating part of the holidays. It's this time of year where we stay up all night and trying to make lists for all the family members, the perfect gift to give them, and tearing up the list and redoing it, tearing our hair out and having to redo it. <coughs> Picking up the right gift for the loved ones is impossible. It's one of the toughest things to do. <laughs> yeah. And then it gets more and more stressful the longer that we put it off. It seems like you can see those frantic shoppers at Christmas time in the last day or two, which would have been me before Amazon. But <laughs> internet shopping has really helped a lot. But they're rushing around stores like wild animals just looking for something 
to buy. Precious minutes vanish into the air and gift shopping becomes less of an act of love and more of a desperate race against the clock. Of course, at Christmas season, families come together to celebrate. Grandparents, aunts, uncles, cousins, they all join together under one roof and they usually have a great time of bonding. However, they all have those family members that are like the ones that visited in the RV to, the, to Chevy Chase in the National Lampoon's Christmas vacation. <laughs> They're always that group of people that you've never quite felt comfortable around. They track mud over the freshly cleaned house that has taken so long to clean. They break your favorite devices or they're just flat out awkward to talk to. No matter what, we always feel a little uncomfortable around them. And if you're thinking to yourself, well, I don't have people like that in my family, you might be those people. <laughs> so, just a thought. <laughs> and then finally Christmas morning arrives, and suddenly you realize that this wonderful season has been stripped of all the joy because of everything that you needed to get done and all the frustrations that go along with it. And then the Christmas season ends. It's done. And all those pesky annoyances are gone. But then we're left with this feeling that's almost worse than the feeling before holidays. This sort of weird empty void appears in us because the next holiday season is so far away now. We've got nothing to look forward to in the near future. All we have is gray weather and fog. People are left questioning what excitement there is left in life after the holidays finish, unless you happen to have a birthday right after that. And it feels like we're all in the doldrums, nothing to look forward to. And ironically, it's this particular transitional period where you begin to miss those awkward family situations and the pressures surrounding the holiday season, and you kind of look forward to the next one that's going to come along fairly soon. Enduring, enduring some of the annoyances around the Christmas period is worth the excitement and the joy that it can cause to us and those around us. Regardless of annual traditions, it's undeniable that the energy surrounding the Christmas spirit is something very special. So while there's some aspects of the season that might frustrate us, let's all try and take joy in every bit of the holiday season that we come across, whether it's good or whether it's bad. The book of Philippians, many of you studied this, read it, it's only 104 verses long. But over and over again, joy splashes out of the pages of Philippians because that's what Paul was feeling when he wrote it. And it's obvious. Twelve times in this, in this letter we find the Greek word for joy or joyful. And it's only four short chapters. The message in this letter is fairly simple, but it's revolution. it has the ability to revolutionize the potential to transform our lives. It starts early in chapter 1. So even in verse 3, Paul is already feeling effusive. I thank my God every time I remember you. And he's saying this to the Philippians. In all my prayers for you, I always pray with joy because out of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident in this, and he who began, to, began a good work in you and carry on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. It is right for me to feel this way about all of you since I have you in my heart. And whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. So this is a letter that Paul likes to write. He likes, he's enjoying writing to the Philippians because he has a lot of great stuff to say about them. He knows they have a strong partnership with the church. And to lead the Philippians to this truth, Paul took them directly to Jesus, teaching them that a community of believers living in harmony with one another comes only through the mutual humility that is modeled on Christ himself. And a lot of Paul's writing had this in it. It's like this importance to model ourselves on Christ himself, or at least try our hardest to get as close as possible to what Christ wants us to be. Paul wrote in Philippians that he pulled out, poured out his life as an offering for the sake of Christ, leading Paul to find great joy and contentment. And he finds it through Christ's service. This letter to the Philippians also shows them that they can center their lives on Christ and they can also live in pure joy. As people, we sometimes become desperate. We search for joy in all kinds of ways. 
We acquire possessions, surround ourselves with possessions. We visit places in the, in the hope of finding joy. We see people that are joyful and hope that it will rub off on us. We search for joy often in all the wrong places. And so many times, none of these things can provide the lasting joy that Christ can. So where do you find joy in the midst of trying circumstances? Where do you find joy when things are not going the way you expected them to? Well, Paul knew, as did the Philippians, that true joy comes through the humble faith in the saving work of Jesus Christ, joining ourselves in harmony with his followers and serving others in the name of Christ. This was a life experienced by the Philippian believers, and it is still a life that's available to us today. We must allow the joy that we find in Christ to keep us from useless arguments, to keep us from useless divisions, to stop us from letting the frustrations in life push us down and strip us of all joy, especially during the Christmas period. We have to guide our, harmonious, our relationships into a harmonious state, not just with God's people, the brothers and sisters that surround us, our church here or the universal church, but also anyone that God chooses to place in front of us. We should be open to sharing the gospel with anyone that God wants us to. So I want to put out a challenge this morning. There are four chapters in the book of, in the letter of Philippians. It's not very long. There are also four Sundays left in 2018, including this one. So read one chapter of Philippians each weekend so that you have read the joy-filled letter that Paul wrote before the end of this year, ready to go into 2019. I've already read you the first six verses of the first one, so you're 20% done with chapter one. So just, <laughs> you're welcome. So <laughs> it's not that hard, not that long. So just take, make that choice. Make that choice. And some of you are thinking, I know Philippians, I know Paul's writing, it's all about contentment. Chapter 4, verse 12, I know what it is to be in need and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. Very common memorized verse, verse in Philippians. But this is not about contentment. What Paul is saying in this passage is that he's reassuring his brothers and sisters in Philippi that he's fine. Physically, he's fine. He's content with his physical situation. That's actually irrelevant. So he's saying it's not a big deal. I'm content with my physical circumstances because it's not important to me what my physical circumstances are. This isn't about contentment. This is about pure joy, so much more than just contentment. Paul throws around, around words like joy, joyful, rejoice, shining like a star. Like he, he's very passionate about this letter. James is equally as passionate about his letter when he says, consider it pure joy whenever you face trials of many kinds. And that's in chapter 1. Right at the beginning he says, life is going to be hard. But if you find pure joy, it will make it that bit easier. And it's a choice. You choose joy. And it becomes a very intentional pathway when James is framing it like this, because it has to be intentional when life is really tough. When you're up to the thick of it, you're up to your waist in trials and troubles, and you're looking for joy, James is pretty clear about this. When you walk through the valleys that life brings you, when there is experience, there is experience that comes out of that, knowledge that comes out of that. And the experience and knowledge strengthens us and provides for us the ability to walk through other stressful times with a little more confidence than we had before. Choosing to see joy in everything can be habit-forming. If you make that decision every day, then after a while it won't be an effort anymore. It's just something that you do. But what it does is force us to look at things that are happening in our lives, look at the world around us, and see God's hand in every little thing that we, that we experience or every little thing that we see. If you're an athlete or someone that does a lot of exercising or somebody that doesn't do it very often but occasionally goes out and has a quick sort of binge exercise, and then you'll understand this analogy as to what James was trying to get to. If you push yourself hard in a, work, in a workout, you get up the next day and you feel the pain in your muscles. You know that you have pushed your muscles and it's painful now, but you know that ultimately it'll make you stronger. So the next time you go out and push yourself, it becomes just a little bit easier. You still feel the pain, 
but it's a little bit easier. And then it's a little bit easier again the next time, and the next time it's easier again. Until you're strong, and you're able to handle pretty much any physical activity that comes your way with very little effort. And that's good. We get satisfaction from knowing that long term, it'll pay off, despite the pain that we go through short term. Well, this is what James is saying. We go through things, these trials in life, because when we do, the next time, it becomes just a little bit easier. The experience we have, the knowledge we have, just makes it a little bit easier the next time. And we learn through this process that every time, God stands with us. God stays with us. He doesn't walk away from us. We also learn that these seasons pass, because now they're history. We went through that. It's finished. So we know we're not going to dwell in times of hardship. And so with this new mindset on hardships, that the trials in life can be like a tough workout, preparing us for long-term strength, then we can begin to take joy. I'll end with this story. Marcia sat in the passenger seat of a car. Her back was pressed into the cushion. She was anything but relaxed. In the driver's seat, her husband Rodney drove white knuckle towards their home. Moments ago, they'd been serving in one of the rooms of the church. They'd received an urgent message from their neighbor that their house was on fire. Why? Her mind surged with this relentless question. Would this have happened if they'd not been at church? Why would this happen to them when they're serving the Lord in church? Where was the protection that she had prayed for? And why now? It was December 15th, and there was only 10 days till Christmas. Just that morning, she'd been checking items off her packed Christmas to-do list, and she asked herself, where is Christmas in all this? Where is the feeling of joy? Where is the feeling of peace that I'm supposed to be experiencing? And so they'd gone to church to serve in search of this Christmas joy, and they felt it there in abundance until they'd received this terrible news. Their teenage children, Michael and Janice, came running from the neighbor's house where they'd managed to escape to. Three more, Brian, Carol, and Katie, would soon arrive home from school. They gathered the two who were there in their arms and hung on tight. She was desperately happy that they were safe. There had been protection. It seemed like forever until they were allowed to go back to their home, or back inside their house. Marsha hunted around the mess to find family photos, family books, and records, and amazingly, they were intact. The Christmas tree looked sad. She could hardly believe it as she discovered the precious nativity set was still safe. It had been set on the bookshelf by the wall that the firefighters had chopped out in order to get into the house. There was no way they could live in the house while repairs were being made. For one thing, the smell of the smoke was unbearable. They learned that their homeowner's insurance would put them up at a nearby hotel while things were being made livable again. But what would Christmas be like without a home? After they got settled into a hotel, Marsha plugged in a hot plate and made a dinner for the seven of them. If there was ever an excuse to go out and eat, it was now. But she wanted to bring just a tiny bit of normalcy to the lives that had been turned upside down. Trips through the drive through would come soon enough, and as she spooned past her onto the paper plate, she thought about the beautiful Christmas decorations that they'd put up only two weeks before. What could she do to bring a little bit of Christmas to this functional sparseness of a hotel room? Her mind immediately went back to the white porcelain nativity set that she'd been so relieved was safe. That would be the perfect thing. The next day, she was armed with a list of things that they needed to bring back to the hotel from the house. The nativity set was at the top of the list, and she, as she drove to the house, she, she, and then she hurried to grab laundry soap, homework, and a favorite doll. Then she stepped up to the box where the items from the bookshelf had been stored, including the nativity set. She picked up Mary and Joseph, found assorted angels and shepherds. She tucked them into a soft blanket for transport, and she saw the sheep and the cattle, the smooth porcelain glinting in the dim light of the room. And though she looked carefully again and again, one piece was missing from the nativity set. And it was the most important piece, the figurine of the baby Jesus. She searched the room without hope. Scraps of wood and wallboard, piping and wires covered the room in a huge mess, Finally, coughing from the bitter air, she left, and the nativity set remained behind. Because what was the point of a set with no baby Jesus? We lost him, she thought, as she drove back to the hotel. And yet we still need to keep the spirit of Christmas alive this year, somehow. 
And they did. On Christmas Eve, they braved the smell of the still that was still lingering in their home to go home for the evening, to gather around the once glorious Christmas tree and share what gifts they had managed to pull together or to salvage. They gave testimonies of the Lord's Savior, Lord and Savior, and they gave testimonies of their many blessings, that they were safe and they had each other. That Christmas was like no other. They would never forget that year. Despite the craziness of seven people living in a hotel room, despite being separated from most of their comforts and belongings, they felt a deeper closeness to to the family. And they understood more clearly, more than they ever had before, that it was because of the Savior's birth, his life, and his death that they could spend time with family now and then be together forever. And while the kids were looking through the debris for things that they could salvage, 13-year-old Brian came towards Marsha, cradled in his hands was the missing figurine of Jesus. Brian had found lost baby Jesus. And Jesus wasn't born in grand surroundings. He was born amid the messiness of an animal stable. In the same way that Brian had found Jesus amidst the burnt mess. And it served as a tender reminder of Jesus' inconspicuous and humble birth 2,000 years ago. A precious stone in a pile of burnt garbage that was our sin. When Christmas is stripped bare by fire and all you have remaining is family and the joy of Jesus' birth, then it becomes much more obvious. These are the times that we remember, not the numerous other Christmases where we have everything that we think we need to make everything just perfect for the family. But at times like this, it makes it obvious that ultimately all we need at Christmas time is friends and family and the joy of living with Jesus in our hearts. The rest of it is fun, but it's nothing that we'll remember in the long run. So even Elijah got out from under the juniper tree. He regained his joy. He recruited Elijah and anointed a new king. Walter Knight once said, Joy is the flag which is flown from the castle of the heart when the king is in residence. Joy is the flag which is flown from the castle of the heart when the king is in residence. It's a choice we make. Are we going to fly the flag of joy from our hearts this Christmas? No matter what tries to derail us, no matter who tries to be the Grinch in our lives, no matter how many rude shoppers, rude drivers, and no matter how inappropriate family members are going to be, are we going to choose joy? So be the voice for joy this year. Stand up for joy. Stand up if you want the joy of the birth of Christ. That the joy that the birth of Christ brings us. Choose joy, because I tell you, when you choose the joy of Christ, your whole perspective will change. Your outlook on life will change. And the way that you walk through the trials of life will change. Because joy comes from our salvation through Christ. And it starts with his birth. Let's pray. Lord God, you've made it so undeniable to us that we should take joy. Not just through the writings of Paul or James or anyone else that wrote about it, but it's just so obvious to us because when we choose joy, we feel joy and we know that you are with us in our hearts. We know that you walk with us even when things are not going the way we want them to. We know that you are there for us every step of the way. So Lord, open our eyes and our hearts to see the joy in everything around us and your hand in everything that we do, in everything that we see, and in the other people around us. Lord, this Christmas, help us to share the joy. Provide the message to those who need to hear it and to be a voice for your gospel in a burnt, sinful world. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Have a good day.